like to call the July 28th, 2021 meeting of the Continuous Learning Task Force to order. Ryan, will you call the roll? Will you vote, Ryan? Brooks? Kevin Cooper? Here. Steve Corbett? Joe Davi? Here. Ryan Moore? Here. Barry Irwin? Here. Gordon Ford? Here. Lauren Gleason? Richard Archery? Senator Stephen Jackson? William Kennedy? Here. Cynthia Posey? Jeff Powell? Stephen Procopio? Dwayne Robertson? Here. Kristen Stein? Representative Holly Thomas and Nancy Torres. Here. All right, so before we jump into the agenda, I just want to introduce you all to Ronnie Morris. And um, he is the um, replacement for Ashley Ellis, who was our representative on Bessie, and so she could not make the last two meetings, and so Ronnie is now officially a member of the task force. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, good green light here. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'll make sure that uh, introduction. Uh, I represent uh, District 6 on the Bessie board, so basically that runs from Baton Rouge to the Mississippi State Line, and so it's a five-carriage area. Uh, the good news for me is I was going to retire six weeks ago, so my wife and I are really celebrating that. Uh, but a uh, year and a half into the four years of getting on the best board, it's been a really positive experience so far. Uh, just looking forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So in your packets, you have the minutes from last meeting. However, we do not have a forum right now, so we will need a motion to postpone the approval of the minutes. If we do have a quorum later today, we can come back to it. If not, we'll just move it to next meeting and approve both of those sets of minutes in August. So do I have a motion and a second to postpone the minutes? Motion to postpone the minutes. Thank you, Joe. Second. And Barry, second, or Wayne, second. Thank you, great. Um, so we are going to jump into last month's working group recommendations. So last month we took two of our key focus areas, we split into two groups, and our groups identified and really brainstormed around three things, and that was what the importance of this focus area was, what the ideal state would look like in Louisiana, and then recommendations around different levers. And so each of those groups then shared with the whole group when they came back what their um, brainstorm was. And so I compiled all of those notes, and I want to share those with you all. We will not vote on these recommendations today. We'll vote on all four areas recommendations at our next meeting. But I do want to share with you just a recap of what the group talked about and then also ask to see if you think there's anything missing or needs to be changed or any just general feedback um, in these areas. So in the technology working group, the group brainstormed around the importance, meaning that in order for a school system to be able to pivot from in-person instruction to virtual learning, it needs to happen immediately in the event there is some sort of crisis or emergency, and that high quality teaching and learning is continued. So that is essential, that must happen. And the ideal state of what that would look like in Louisiana is listed here. So that means all employees and students would have access to the internet and devices at home. They would be updated and replaced on a cycle determined by uh, the product or the district. They would have a device and internet access distribution plan and systems in place. There would always be a one-to-one student-to-device ratio at school and home. 
Students are using technology in the classroom and at home on a regular basis for meaningful learning so that when they do go to continuous learning, it's just a seamless process. The last piece was that there would be a high quality learning management system in place in the school systems and that they are using that effectively during in-person instruction so that when they go to virtual learning or continuous learning, the students and families would already be used to that system. So, well, I'll say before I go to the recommendations, are there any comments, questions, things you all think should be added here for the importance of this area and then the ideal state of what this would look like? Go ahead, Ryan. Can I have a couple comments um, on the personal importance? I had a question about immediately. So, how do we define immediately? I mean, should we have a sense of expectation that um, folks have you know, said days a week? Uh, something relevant in compliance with governor's order or something like that, as opposed to immediately. Um, just throwing that out there, you know, set some clear expectation for a response time. So, members of that group should definitely speak up and, and share about that, but I think, Ronnie, the intention was we don't want students to go by for so long without having instruction, and so if there is a fire at a school, a weather emergency, that that continuous learning plan could go into effect you know, the next day. But others in the working group um, should chime in too. Do y'all have anything you'd add to that? I think that was our point. Uh, during the spring of, of 2020, uh, when we shut down, we were not prepared to immediately go into non-face-to-face -face learning. Uh, today, with the Chromebook, the hotspots, uh, the availability, if we have any events, I expect our schools to be able to, within a day's time, distribute everything and be able to continue learning you know, as soon as possible. I, I would say within a, within a day or so. Uh, we can change that language, too, or clarify it in the report, Ronnie, because that's true. What, what does immediately mean? Maybe it is as soon as possible, depending on the, the event. It sounds like we're hearing is basically a seamless transfer. Exactly. Yeah. The, other, the other question I had in comment was with regard to the first bullet of our ideal state, um, access to the internet. Um, is it good enough just to have access to the internet, or do we need to have access at a certain speed uh, so that we can actually follow uh, the material appropriately? Um, that might be worth a little more clarification there. And Ronnie, I'll say last meeting, we had Denise Iyengar, who's our director of um, the Office of Broadband, come and speak, and he did talk about this thing. So I think we can definitely add, um, well, I guess I should say this. This list here and what we'll go through today will help generate a more uh, lengthy report that will go into detail here. So we can add guidance on that or making sure that it is aligned to whatever the current standard is around that. I think that would be an excellent addition. I think we discussed that. Uh, I think we discussed that to a degree, but and it says an ideal state. Uh, as I expressed at our last meeting, we have areas within our rural parish that have no internet access, period. And that, they're not going too far a period of time. Uh, there are some things in the works uh, apparently to supply that access uh, but I think the word ideal is, is kind of a key word right there in that. If we were to move to virtual learning tomorrow uh, probably 85 percent of our kids will have access through the hotspots and Chromebooks at their home but we probably still have probably 15 to 20 percent that simply do not have the internet access there so ideally we would hope that everybody had an internet speed that is viable to, to do the right? And you got a commitment from Denise to take care of that, right? Well, he is—he definitely committed to working on it, yes. And he shared some of his plans about how to do that. Um, but, but it's a three-year plan. It's not anything that's going to happen over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and folks in the city often forget, like Mr. Kenny is talking about, even in, in rural North Louisiana, Inside the city limits of most cities, you can get some sort of internet service. But with him and Homer and me in Grambling, there are kids and families that live between his school and my school where they can't even get cell phone coverage at their home. 
I mean, I don't have cell phone coverage in my home. I have to use my wired internet service to power my cell phones at my house because there's no cell coverage at my home. So somebody that doesn't have DSL or doesn't have some other type of internet, which 25 speed DSL is all that's available at my home. And, and so there are a lot of areas where it just doesn't exist. Um, one other thing um, that I had not thought about until you just mentioned him, you know, we, we, um, we talk about this in the military all the time. We're always working in the last war. And when we talk about this, a lot of our thoughts are about what just happened and what we just did. And you mentioned the word fire. And I thought about what in the world would I do if I had a fire and it burned up the building where I have all my Chromebooks at? Because right now, we don't have kids with these machines at home. If, you know, we're looking at all of these possible contingencies, right. like Mr. Kennedy said, we could probably pivot and get everything distributed out within a day or two. But what if the catastrophic event is the building and all of that stuff that then is destroyed? So I don't know. We, we may have to expand the scope of our thinking. So I'll just add, uh, we sort of touched on that a little bit at the last meeting in that all of us keep talking about the continuous learning plan as it's a, a virtual transition, but trying to find a way in our recommendations and our guidance to incorporate the fact that virtual transition might not be an option, in particularly in some areas or because of whatever the event is. So if, if it's a hurricane, for example, and there is no power for 12 days, which some people have lived through recently. Or 12 weeks. Or weeks. <laughs> <laughs> or <coughs> ridiculous snowstorms that never happen and all of a sudden, you know, you can't, you can't access your device. The technology is not going to be the alternate form of instruction that we're going to have. And although I recognize that's one of our areas, either in a technology or incorporating into some other area, I think we're going to need to be very clear about guidance and ideal states for things other than technology because that will be a situation that occurs. Anything else? Hey, Anne, just one I quick note. I just got a note from um, LAPCS and they're trying to review this meeting and they said nothing is showing up. I'll check it. Thank you. You're welcome. I love how you were responsible for the live stream. <laughs> we might make you go, uh, I don't know how to do that. No, I'm their representative. <laughs> no, I'm, um, so I'm, everything that you all are saying, I'm making notes of, and I will adjust this so when we meet next time, it'll reflect these changes. And then when we meet, we'll um, vote on the ideal state, the importance, and the levers. And then after that, we'll build out you know, that, that more detailed report. So I appreciate your feedback here. So do schools have a plan for other emergencies, like for fire? Yes. Okay. So what do you do? You just go to alternate place? We, during the winter storm last spring, we lost the building. We lost the, uh, the uh, an elementary building that housed about 400 kids. Uh, we, we, of course, obviously we had to shut down. Uh, we had third and fourth graders back face to face in three days. Uh, second graders, there were like the fourth or fifth day. Within within seven days, we had every kid back on a campus somewhere receiving face-to-face -face learning. Uh, but like like Gordon said, we had, those children don't take crumbles home daily. So those crumbles were stored within the building. Uh, most of them did not sustain any damage. So we were able to issue them to children and do the virtual learning while we were finding a place to put them in school. And we put them back in, in two gymnasiums, uh, and other classrooms, we put some on the junior high campus. We, we had our elementary staff spread out everywhere to accommodate the kids. But we were able to get the uh, the Chromebooks and hotspots distributed to kids in just a day or two, so they only missed a day or two. And, and that was a very, very unexpected event for us to, to lose the building and have to immediately find another place. So. Correct me if I'm wrong, but every school has to have a crisis management plan. We have to have So but there is a crisis, it's called a crisis management plan, and there's a team for those situations that when it happens. But I would say there's there was rarely a plan for what happens after that right. happens. So if you're at school, there's a fire, you know what to do. But then after, there wasn't really a, a plan in place, I would say for the most part across our state about how to handle those types of events. And, and we probably really need to make some recommendations in terms of adding those types of things to our plans for our smaller and independent schools. Because for 
someone who has a school district where they can move kids here and there as opposed to somebody who has a school. When you lose that building, what are you going to do with that? Anything else for these items? All right, so these are the initiatives recommendations and policy recommendations. Um, we also had another category, which was guidance and support. So for here, for initiatives, the group talked about implementing digital literacy um, in a more strategic way across the state. So currently we have digital literacy standards, but there is no strategy around how do schools implement those, what does that look like in the classroom. And so um, the group talked about making sure that that was more robust and then also ensuring that the educators were incorporating that through um, learning about it in professional learning communities. Another initiative was ensuring a partnership with the state broadband office to ensure connectivity throughout the state and then also a process for determining the high quality instructional materials that they are using have the technology integration and supports in them. So how do we identify that for school systems, um, whether that's through our current review process, which we do at the state level, or indicate somewhere in our instructional materials guidance that these curriculum have supports embedded. And so that will help support the ideal state, which is students are learning through technology in the classroom in a meaningful way in order to continue to do that at home. And then uh, the policy recommendation here was for our state education technology plan to include components around continuous learning. So um, Louisiana has a state plan. Um, it's actually up for being revised right now, so this is excellent timing. But the group really wanted to make sure continuous learning was included. Any comments or things you all would add or change here? Who owns the state education technology fund today? Um, LDOE. Who's in LDOE? Um, uh, Chanda Johnson's team in academic content has education technology under it. Mm -hmm. How many years ago was that done? updates, um, like small updates, but there hasn't really been a total an overhaul, if you will, of the plan, which is um, something that they're working on, yeah. All right, for the guidance and support category, we talked a lot about family guidance, so how do we support families in using the technology and internet at home? guidance for our leaders and teachers on how to track attendance. And then they also talked about how do we support teachers in helping students maintain academic integrity during continuous learning. So if they're at home, you know, how are we implementing maybe some of those digital literacy standards around, you know, not cheating, using other sources. The other piece was guidance for systems on technology implementation as a district. And all of these little bullets were things that the group talked about that should be included in that plan. So um, how to maintain one-to-one -one ratio, replacement guidance, the types of devices that should be used and for what purposes, how do you control inventory, what are the roles and responsibilities of technology coordinators, to families, to teachers around devices. Um, how do you provide technical support for educators and families with the devices and access? Um, funding recommendations, procurement options, how to issue um, devices um, that includes a policy about how to use those devices for students when they're at home, professional development around it, and then tips for just how to prepare for a lot of these things. So how do you prepare a system? to implement all of this. Is there anything you all want to add, talk about, change? I'd like to just reiterate the, the ESSER funding 
made available for us to, to buy the Chromebooks, to buy the hotspots, to provide the service. When that money's gone, even if we do have broadband connectivity throughout the state, uh, there will be families that cannot afford that. And uh, that, the funding to, to afford it once we get it there. I think in the FCC reverse auction, those that receive that money, I think they have six years to actually get it fully implemented. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a long way out. But still, the funding to, to um, secure it once you have it available is going to be an issue for many families. So uh, I'd just like to point out that there's got to be something done around that point to make it affordable. I can have that. That's great. I, I think part of the answer to that will probably be a look at how we're spending Title I funds. I know most schools and, and school districts do a lot with, with computer replacement and buying computers. One of the things that we're looking at as we're doing construction for Lincoln Prep and looking at how other new schools are designing things, there, there are a lot fewer hard computer labs and desktop machines that will be replaced. And so maybe as we talked about the replacement plan, that might be something that may be a you know, on a three-year funding cycle through your Title I dollars or other things, you can project that as part of your equipment replacement, but it's definitely something that has to be talked about and we'll need to make some, probably make some recommendations about because it's different from what we've been doing. Oh, I thought that was great. Yeah, I think you may have captured it under family guidance for using devices and internet at home, um, but I'd like to see something on here about this general IT so that if the family at home you know, needs that kind of support, you know, we can just give them a call with one eight hundred IT support from our office, right? right. How do you do that from home? <laughs> I have a question there. <laughs> Anything else? That's great. All right, so the second category um, was around system and school planning, and the notes around the importance of this is that school systems need to be prepared yet flexible for operating a system under those modified operations in the event of emergency so that students are safe and learning. So that's why this is so important. The ideal state includes systems and schools having aligned comprehensive plans that are aligned to best practices around emergency planning and that it's reviewed and updated by stakeholders annually within that system. The second one was around the continuous learning planning being included in that emergency plan so that there is no interruption in learning. That would be ideal. It's just seamless again without interruption in student learning. The third one is around adequate resources and personnel to implement those plans. And then lastly, um, really a lot of um, brainstorm around how do we communicate through different channels to educators, families, community members that is frequent, clear, and timely. Is there anything you all would add here or suggest you have for how to expand this in the full report? And then for the recommendations in the initiatives category, there was really one that focused on having a LDOE as a state, having an emergency team that includes community and state partners that has a state emergency plan. And that includes emergency officials, government agencies, community organizations as part of that team. And then around policy, mentioned this on the previous slide, but that systems and schools have that plan that's reviewed by stakeholders and updated annually. Anything you all would add here? I just want to make sure I read y'all's handwriting from this <laughs> chart paper and got it right. <laughs> Right, the 
in full suspense for board set policy. So are we asking that this, this policy recommendation be that school boards create a policy around this and they have a committee and they review it and update it annually? Or is this more geared towards a policy recommendation that school systems have some, or like our discipline committees and school systems, they have outside people who sit on these committees and review things annually? So it was my understanding that this would be a state policy, so that would go to BSE and then do what you said in school systems. So school systems would then have to implement that policy, you know, implement a policy at the local level. Okay. But you all should chime in to make sure that I'm correct. So BSE would have a policy that says every school system and school has to have a plan, they need to have it reviewed and updated annually. Then, when we change our policy, school systems have to make sure their policy is aligned. And if they have one, great. If they don't, they would need to create a policy that uh, aligns to the state policy. And they could have, like, discipline um, working groups. Right. Working group okay, so this would be that school systems have a policy that is aligned to a set the reg that says they need to have a policy, not that their policy aligns to what comes out of the LDOE. Correct, okay. correct. And I'll, I'll be more clear about that. Anything else for this set of recommendations? All right, the last piece was on the guidance and supports category. And this was creating emergency planning guidance with a framework for our lead agencies in K-12 systems, having a vendor guide for emergency planning software or services, and then having a checklist or guidance around how to create and update that school plan or system plan. Is there anything I'm missing or that you all would change here? motion and second to receive the notes from the two working groups held at the July meeting. Thank you very, thank you, Ronnie. So the next section of the agenda is we're gonna go back to our working groups, but we'll use the remaining two categories as the focus for that work. So before we do that, I wanted to share some things around the instructional quality key area and then the family supports area. Um, just to give you all background about things that currently exist that might help you all in your conversation. So since COVID, these things listed here have been implemented across the state. So the first one is um, Accelerate, which was in response to um, learning loss. So how do we address unfinished learning with students? And this is our statewide tutoring strategy. The second piece was um, ensuring that students are learning during summer so that we don't also have summer slide. And so our school systems implemented summer learning programs, which included academics and enrichment. The third piece was around staffing and scheduling. Um, I think I talked about this maybe in another meeting, but one of the biggest recommendations we had from our superintendents was we need you to figure out staffing and scheduling for us because we don't have time or dealing with an emergency and we need to make sure that our staffing models that are in place and our schedules that are in place are aligned to best practices. So we released this initiative um, this past spring as well to help school systems make sure that they are building schedules that include time for addressing unfinished learning um, and that the right staff are in place doing this work. We also had our partnership with LPD that Nancy talked about last time, which was um, I think a good example of one of the previous recommendations was how do we pull community partners in to emergency planning, and so LPD stepped up to help um, really communicate to our um, families around lessons for, um, for math. We also implemented the REAL program, which was 
providing school systems vouchers to give families in need additional access to tutoring through tutoring providers across the state to again address those learning gaps. We also created a learning management system vendor guide so that school systems who didn't have one had um, a guide to go to to purchase one so that there was a transition from home and school with access to lessons and materials that students needed. We, there's a few documents here that we gave school systems. Uh, one of them was implementing Strong Start. So this was aligned to our Strong Start strategy that we released around that first set of funding. And this was to help school systems and school leaders implement those requirements of Strong Start. So it, for example, how do we get to one-to-one -one student device ratio? How do we make sure we have enough materials for all, for all of our kids when they're at home? So we provided guidance there. Also, virtual instruction guides for educators and families. We provided a toolkit for our early childhood um, centers and our pre-K through 12 schools that really focused on what does teaching and learning look like in a virtual setting or a setting that virtual is not an option. So how do you do this with paper, jump drives, all the things that you've all mentioned. Um, we also adapted observation tools for school and system leaders about what classrooms can look like in a virtual setting because it's very different than an in-person setting. So how do you support teachers and instruction if they're on a Zoom? Um, we offered a lot of professional development around Google training, uh, virtual instruction best practices for teachers and leaders and then created a family toolbox for families and then families with students with disabilities on how to provide supports at home, how to access what they need. With these um, supports, there were definitely some takeaways that I wanted to share. Um, the school systems and the educators in the school systems were very flexible um, and adapted to the setting that they were in their systems very quickly. Um, we talked about this before, I mean, teachers can do anything and they do everything and they were very quick to adjust their instructional methods and support students that were not in the building um, through home, whether that was check-ins individually with students, um, small group instruction through Zoom, talking to parents about, you know, how they're doing at home, not just academically. Um, and they also increased their um, intervention time with students that needed it based on how they were performing um, in, in their class. Our school systems did a pretty quick job of providing technology to students and families given the situation, uh, whether that was with devices they already had or purchasing devices, and as soon as those came in, having a way to administer um, or distribute those to families. And they did that through a bunch of different ways, on a school bus, come pick up in the parking lot, um, really did some, some wonderful efforts to get families what they needed. In general, we, you know, we talked about this in the first meeting, but student engagement was a concern. So students showing up for virtual instruction, students remaining in vir virtual instruction throughout the day, um, particularly in our high schools, this was an issue um, because a lot of their instruction was, was left to them to do independently. Um, and I think also, you know, our, our populations of students with disabilities, English learners, our kids in early child care centers um, were the most absent in whatever learning mode they had in, in school. So that was definitely a concern. Um, and as you all have talked about a lot, the quality of instruction varied across the state. Um, that could have been anything from, we had some school systems who really did have a seamless transition. They already had the technology, kids were using it, and they brought it home and instruction happened to school systems who did not reach out for a long time to provide supports for students. So there was everything in between as well. And so I know we will talk about that in the working groups, but that is definitely something that um, was a, a pretty big piece of feedback. In addition to that was, yeah. On that point, just, just to make sure we're thinking about it, even in schools where we had teachers already using Google Classroom, kids already used to it, because we, we were one of them. Within two days we were there, it's still not all the kids. 
um, we were probably at about 85%. And so we still need to, where the school is largely ready, we still need to be thinking about those kids that aren't ready. Yep, that's a great point. That's a great point. And I think a lot of conversations came up around, you know, what is, what counts as instruction? So um, we had lots of questions around instructional minutes, expectations for students during the day, expectations for teachers um, during the day. So um, again, a varied quality across the state, which was a major concern. Um, another thing was continuous learning wasn't really a word that we used before COVID. And so we ran into a lot of issues around policy or guidance, not using that phrase because everything was really written as if kids are in person. And so um, there was just policy uh, around attendance or instructional minutes or expectations for teachers that we got a lot of questions about and that systems dealt with a lot is, you know, does this still count in a continuous learning mode? And so, um, you know, I think we'll talk about that too, but how do we reflect these different types of learning and, and guidance and policy that exists? Lots of feedback from parents wishing there was a portal that had everything they needed. Um, and really for districts to not have to do this on their own. So we have you know, almost 200 school systems. Do we need all 200 school systems doing their own thing or can there be one place that's done for every school system that families could access? And then lots of feedback around parents not knowing what to do and what not to do while their kid was in virtual instruction. So do I need to help them? Do I need to support them? If my kid's in kindergarten, do I need to be with them during that instruction? Um, just a, a need for what is the expectation and responsibility of a parent in that setting. So these were just takeaways based on feedback we got from different sources. We're going to meet in these two working groups. So just a, a quick reminder about them. We'll do the same thing we did last time. So we'll, uh, these were the four areas, but we'll talk about instructional quality, and then we'll go through um, family engagement and supports. And you all will be brainstorming again, why is this important? What is the ideal state in Louisiana? And what are the recommendations we can include in the report around the levers around initiatives, guidance and support, and then policy or law? And so we'll do the same thing. So we're gonna split into another room. So we'll have one group in here, one group in the North Dakota room, and you'll have chart paper markers, all the fun things that you need to brainstorm around those areas. Um, and then again, I listed the things to consider. So the recommendations that this group will um, make need to be, um, thinking about continuous learning for different circumstances. So we've kind of talked, that, talked about that already. So does this recommendation still stand true if it's a weather emergency, if it's a flood, if it's a fire, if it's a pandemic? So be thinking more globally around continuous learning. Um, also, are the recommendations broad enough to allow flexibility? So if we give such a specific recommendation and it can't happen, um, that really prevents the LDOE team or other agencies like the Office of Broadband to carry out that um, recommendation. The recommendations need to align to the ideal state that you all are creating. So when you're brainstorming that, that's how those recommendations should be created. Um, and then do the recommendations allow LDOE or any other agency that we partner with to be able to find the best practices and research to address that recommendation. So, just be thinking about these things as you all need. So I think we'll do what we did again. We'll just have this side of the room stay here. You all can take um, family engagement and supports. We'll have this side of the room do instructional quality and you all can go to that other room that you were in last time. It's the same exact room and the chart paper and markers and post-its and whatever are already in there. Are there any questions before we split into the groups? Um, can I switch with someone in instructional quality? You can switch with me. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. We'll make a switch. Anybody else want to switch? Okay. So after we all meet, we'll come back again, and each group will share the recommendations. So 
It is 1045. Let's come back, or I'll check in with you all around 1115, so about 30 minutes. And if we need more time, we'll have more time. Um, but when you come back, you all will share the um, recommendations around these areas. Everybody again. The truck paper. Yeah. Or? Student's having independent time to do work. 
And if that work was associated with some type of creative outlet, project-based learning, something where a teacher might have a rubric or a worksheet or some mechanism to give students a 30 minute, one hour, hour and a half independent study period with some guidance of go outdoors and create an art project and then take a picture of it and send it back to the teacher. We thought that that kind of value in students is important and should be recognized as learning um, when a student's not in the classroom because it can create thinking skills, it can reach creativity, it can create true independent study. Um, but trying to, I think in terms of guidance, what we were really hoping for is some direction for teachers on how to assign students these types of things that give them flexibility, things that they can do with stuff around their house, and then also for the teacher to have guidance on how to get the information back from the student about what took place during that time. Um, you know, either having a rubric or having the student practice their writing by writing a one pager on what they did during that time, or having them photograph what they were doing and submitting it through email or Google Classroom. So some type of guidance or framework where students can have individual independent time that is valued and attributed as learning during the course of the day, but that can also sort of have an end product or some credibility to it because the teacher is getting something back to the student about that independent time. Um, oh, and also we've <clears throat> talked about that anything related to instructional quality um, should include an equity component, that it should be culturally and linguistically relevant to students and their communities and, um, and their access. And so whatever recommendations we create, so for example, independent study, they should not require students to, uh, for example, have to expend money to be able to complete the project or uh, to be able to have access to a grocery store or gas station to be able to complete the project. We should be using language that they understand, language that is relevant, and it should be able to be a project or an independent type of learning that any student can do, um, regardless of what student group they pull into. I think that was it. Any comments, questions? Very good. Oh, really good. Only one, I, you know, you talked that whole conversation about instructional minutes. It's something that def definitely needs to be talked about because we had some of those conversations because it's almost like people expect during continuous learning that teachers are going to do 50 minutes of direct instruction. And that's not what normally happens in a classroom. There's a period of direct instruction and there's a period where kids are doing some, some work, some independent work. They're working on assignments and that kind of thing. And so how we're counting instructional minutes is going to be important when we get into these kinds of situations. Great. All right, next group. Okay, so all right, our group focused on family engagement and support, and it was really fun. Mr. Kennedy and I did probably most of the talking. Um, Nancy kept us, Nancy kept us organized, and Ronnie kept us focused. <laughs> Every time we would get off, he would look at his watch, or he would say, "Okay, let's get back to the topic," which was really good. So. Um, first thing we talked about was importance. I think everybody agrees that it's critical. I think the language that we ultimately came up with is you cannot do continuous learning without continuous family support. Just like we have to continuously support our teachers and have professional development throughout the year, if we're in a continuous learning situation, we're going to have to continuously support our families. Um, recognize that it varies by grade and age level, grade level and age, and understanding the needs of families all the way down to an individual level are going to be important to support them. Ronnie kind of gave us an overall synopsis of what we're looking for, and he boiled it down to three things. If we're, if we're expecting parents to participate in this, then they need a contract which sets expectations. The kid's going to need a coach, whether it's a parent or some other caring adult in their life, and then they're going to need resources from the school in terms of what to do and how to do it. And so we talked about an ideal state. An ideal state is this. Every child has a coach, a, a parent or a caregiver, that has expectations and is ensuring that continuous learning is going on with the appropriate resources and knowledge. And then that would also include regular communication and appropriate use of communications tools. And what Ronnie boiled that down to is, 
We need a coach, and the coach has to have a game plan. And so have to identify who that adult is. It might not be the parent. It might be a grandparent. It might be an aunt. It might be an uncle. It might be somebody at the school. It might be somebody else in the community. And so one of the things Nancy talked about was the true importance of bringing parents into the school. Ms. Kennedy talked about some things that they did in parental involvement. And so getting parents in the school, getting community members in the school, and broadening that school family when we're not doing continuous learning so that when we get to continuous learning, we can do that. We, um, we actually cheated during our group. We had, a, um, we had a classroom teacher here from Jefferson Parish, and she chimed up and told us a couple of things about, uh, about communicating with parents. And so we, you know, we appreciate that, and we, you know, we use that input. So if her superintendent is on, she's here, and she helped us. Appreciate it. Um, so some recommendations. Um, we talked about um, having that parent-student contract, which is really a memorandum of understanding. You can't enforce it on the parents, but it, said it sets expectations. In Clayton Parish School System, they had a separate document for students and one for parents. At Lincoln Preparatory School, we had one document, and the parent and the student both signed the same document. But it lays out, here's what the school is going to do, here's what the school is going to provide, here's what we expect of the student, here's what we expect of the parent that's supporting that student. Um, he talked about the importance of having parental activities all the time. If you wait until it's time to do continuous learning to engage parents, the game is over. It's already too late. And so we have to, just like we're having this task force and talking about what we have to do on the education side, we can't wait until continuous learning has to happen to engage parents. We have to work to get our parents engaged and keep them engaged. Because one of the things that we found is when the pandemic happened, our PTA organization basically fell apart. We had less parental support. And Nancy talked about the importance of those family networks and having families supporting each other and building those small family groups that can help support each other as we do this. So support from community leaders, community partnerships, those surrogate parents and folks in education know what I'm talking about. You can't get a hold of mama, so you call grandma, you call auntie, you call uncle. You know, the, the third grade teacher goes to church with the kid and can see him in Sunday school class, whatever that looks like. Finding that person, if you're not getting the parental support you need, Finding that next adult in the chain that can help you get that kid engaged and on track. Using mentoring programs with other organizations, I told them about how we are situated in a university town and we use the university organizations, the fraternities, sororities, some of the other organizations on campus that come in and mentor with kids and we use them to reach out, hey, this kid that you mentor, have you talked to them? Can you reach out to them? We are not getting anything from them. And so have a list of surrogate parents or places to find those surrogate parents. So for schools, for, for schools that have not done this or not used to this, give them some resources to say, hey, look, if you're having problems with parental contacts, here are some types of community agencies that may already exist in your community that can help you support these children in continuous learning. And then the big thing that our teacher talked to us about was the families need training on the technology. A lot of us did some training up front at the beginning of school, but we don't stop professional development with our teachers after the first week of school. And if we're expecting our parents to pick up some of those roles, they're going to need some training and some continuous training as well. And so we need to be thinking about that and thinking about what that looks like. Somebody even asked the question, you know, the and I don't know if it was in the whole group or when we broke up, but you know, when we're doing a lot of stuff, we can pick up and call the IT support person. And who is that for a parent that's having trouble getting their kid, you know, getting their kids work done and getting their assignments set? So being able to get that training on the technology and making sure that they do it. One of the things that I pointed out that we found through this process is that emails are often more reliable than phone numbers for a lot of folks. A lot of folks change their phone numbers often for a lot of different reasons, but people don't change their email addresses a lot. And so a lot of times if you got emails, you can contact, and a lot of the tools that we're using now that are app-based, whether it's Remind app or these types of things, have the ability to contact people through both cell phones and through email addresses, and so using all those different multiple things. But the bottom line is boots on the ground, and we talked about sometimes it's needing more people, sometimes it's reassigning people, but, the, but, but being able to identify the folks that need to do the things that we need to do. Mr. Kennedy's talking about they're looking at hiring a person just to look at truancy for kids who are not participating and being able to look at those things and track those kids. But the, the, the big thing about 
of um, going back to family engagement is if the family is not engaged, then continuous learning cannot happen. It just can't. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Things you add? That's a lot. It is a lot. <coughs> I love how organized you guys were. Yeah. It was beautiful, your chart. Thank you. It's very organized. She kept this organized. She kept this focused. Miss <laughs> Kane and I did a lot of talk. <laughs> My own board. No, you were saying no, I'm not doing So, this might be the most fun task force that's ever existed, by the way. Y'all are, uh, are great. I appreciate your, your feedback and comments, and I will do the same thing as last time. Take those notes put them in the different categories, and then share them for our next meeting in August. And then we'll give feedback again, to make sure I have everything right, and then we will vote on all four areas. So we'll look through each of those four areas again and make sure those are the right recommendations. And that will be our last meeting. After that, those recommendations will be um, created in a much lengthier report that will then be assigned to the people that need to implement those things. So, for example, we have someone at the department who oversees family engagement. She'll probably be assigned most of the things on that list. Technology, we'll work with Office of Broadband and our technology team. And so that's how it'll, it'll end up playing out after next meeting. So, um, when is next meeting? August 14th. August 24th. And it is in this room, and it is at one o'clock, so our quote normal time. This was the time that uh, was different than the rest. Mm -hmm. Which is, which was so much better for me because now I can get to Georgia at seven o'clock. That's right. It's just for you. Just for you. Is there any public comment, Brian? Okay. All right. Yeah, can I get in one question? Sure. It's my first meeting, so yeah, I have all the background, but I was curious. Um, it may fall under your uh, instructional quality, I'm not sure, but what about, uh, what about testing? I'm curious if there's any conversation about some sort of standardization for monitoring and testing. Um, as far as if it's at home? Right, right. So if I'm out for, you know, a hurricane in Lake Charles and you know, I'm out of school for two, three, four weeks or whatever, you know, there's got to be some testing that's appropriate and you know how you monitor uh, that, that individual with no testing. I know at LSU there's a standard policy for right. student testing, uh, but I'm not that familiar with what it is in this space. So if you guys have had that conversation. Sure. So two things. One, we did have to release guidance um, before the beginning of last school year of how to do some of those assessments virtually. So it does exist. I think also it was in the technology recommendations around how to support systems and academic integrity around testing. So uh, making sure that it's secure, you know, kids don't have access to other materials to use for that. So I think in two places it's being addressed, but I can call it out more specifically if that's what you're Yeah, suggesting. I'm just really interested in if there's been any discussion around the standardized process for this. I can add that. For electronic surveillance. Okay. Were you going to add something? Yeah, we, we never really got that far. We did, we were able to use the Leap 360 tool um, as a benchmark tool at home. Um, kids were able to take it at home and we were able to get data from that. But as far as something that is a, a summative type assessment, we, we have not gotten there. So you guys did do Leap testing at home? We, we, did leap bench, we did Leap benchmarking, Leap 360, we did that at home, but then the kids came on site to actually take the test. Yes. And we also have, Bonnie, a couple assessments at the beginning of the year. Um, our kindergartners have to take a kindergarten entry assessment, and then our K-3 have to take a literacy screener. And we did create guidance of how that can be done at home, especially because they have to do it within the first 30 days of school, which most of our kids, you know, at that point were at home. Um, but it was not, what Gordon is saying, the summative, you know, assessment that's LEAP 2025. It was for all of the other ones. Now, we didn't do any of those virtual, we did them face to face, and that included in some cases sending staff members to houses to do it because it, it, it can be done virtually, I understand, but the teachers thought it was very difficult. Um, I did also want to point out I know you asked for public comments online. We do have a couple of members of the public here, and I didn't know if they wanted to speak. Um, 
we don't have any public comment for it. Oh, and we're not. Okay. All right. So, um, do I have a motion and a second to receive the recommendations from Orford? Motion. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Before we adjourn, I have one announcement, if you guys don't mind. Um, sure. I know that Ronnie has replaced Ashley, but I didn't know if everybody here knows this. Ashley Ellis was just named the new principal of Neville Junior High School in Monroe, so congratulations to her. Great. Anything else before we adjourn? Move to adjourn. Thank you, Gordon. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Nancy. All right, see you all on August 24th. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah the Ellis's are moving and shaking. Yeah, we're moving more. Thanks, everybody. Y'all are an awesome team. I think we should just keep this group in <laughs> every task force meeting. We just did this. This is definitely yeah. not your average uh, task force <laughs> meeting. Y'all are very um, good. Appreciate all your help. Uh, I think I missed an email this morning. <laughs>